Thank you. Well, now, this is the part of the cruise where you get to give your brain a rest and just have some fun. Isn't it a great, a great cruise? I, having access to these uh, amazing, intelligent people is just fantastic. But uh, for now, you just have me. There was this young man, and he was on trial. And the uh, judge was chastising him. He, he was saying, how could you possibly justify such a terrible deed, killing a California condor? There are only 28, well, there are only 27 of them left in the wild. What could possibly have been going through your mind to allow you to do such a heinous deed? The young man said, your honor, I was camping. I was lost in the wilderness, and as I laid there, uh, this giant buzzard landed on top of me, I must have looked pretty bad, and started pecking at me. And with the last ounce of strength in my body, I picked up a rock, I bashed him in the skull, and I ate him. It was a matter of sustenance. It was a matter of survival. And the judge said, well, that's a pretty good explanation. I may just uh, let you off. Just out of curiosity, what did it taste like? And he said, well, it was kind of a cross between a bald eagle and a spotted owl. A story with a twist, an element of humor to capture your attention, and then the fatal blow. In essence, that's editorial cartooning. When people ask me what is an editorial cartoonist, I always say, well, we're a hybrid. We're a cross between Edward R. Murrow, Ted Koppel, and the son of Sam. <laughs> editorial cartoons are about concept. The illustration is merely a vehicle to convey a point of view. We're here to protect and inform the public, to attack and repel those who do not share our long-term interests, you know, basically, I, I like to say I get paid to be obnoxious. It's the only other profession besides dentistry where you get paid to be obnoxious. Politicians would have you think that they're paid to be obnoxious. They're not paid to be, they're just obnoxious. <laughs> it's a profession about ideas. 95% of what I do is concept or pushing a particular point of, of view. We are the pit bulls of journalism. We're trained to attack at the slightest provocation. We're the prosecution pushing for a rapid conviction and an immediate execution. We are the defense punching holes in the arguments raised against our cause. We are judge, we are jury, and since I'm not on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, my judgments actually make sense. <laughs> we stand in judgment over the issues and the sentence that we levy is swift and harsh. But in order to be judge and jury, you have to read and research to digest the complex issues and bring some semblance of order to them. So, now clearly I'm one of the most boring people in the world. Uh, I start the day around five o'clock. In my capacity as a senior editor at Investors Business Daily, I'm not only the editorial cartoonist, but I co-manage the, the editorial page. So I start preparing for our editorial meetings around five. And then um, I watch the news and see what's being absorbed in the American consciousness about every half hour. Um, I read four papers a day. I, of course, read the National Review. Um, I read the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. A lot of people say that the uh, truth lies somewhere between those two editorial pages. Actually, the truth lies in the editorial pages of Investor's Business Daily. Thank you. You know, and if I want a good laugh, sometimes I'll watch MSNBC or read The Nation. I think it's important to view the issues on the broadest possible uh, reference plane. In fact, if you firmly believe in an issue, I, I urge you to read the opposite of it. I think most of the time, you'll, it'll merely reinforce your original beliefs, but every once in a while, on the rare occasion, you might change your mind. And either way, you have a larger and more comprehensive view of the issue. I believe it's important to understand all sides of an issue, and that entails knowing the contrary point of view. I'm a firm believer in the statement, known thine enemy. So that's why I watch C-SPAN. Now, <laughs> editorial cartoonists, you see, we spend our time gathering information. We process the information to draw a conclusion, to draw a cartoon, and hopefully, if it's done well, to draw blood. Now, unfortunately, in the modern trend in editorial cartooning has been to make simple jokes about uh, current affairs. And I think humor without substantive statements diminishes the importance of an editorial cartoon. An editorial cartoon is not just a funny picture. 
A good editorial cartoon is a fine instrument of journalism. At times, it's sharp and refined, its message cutting quickly to the point. At times, blunt, with its dark imagery seizing the reader's attention. As with any editorial, the most important element of it is the message. It defines an issue. It challenges hypocrisy. It reveals the best and worst of humanity. It calls the readers to arms against the complacent, the lethargic, the evildoers. And by that, I mean the Obama administration <laughs> and the indolent body politic and the champions of the status quo. It exposes the assorted predators of society. But a good editorial cartoon shouldn't just be well-researched. It should be carefully contemplated. So, you know, my hardest job is to refrain myself from doing too many obnoxious things. Um, for instance, if you remember Johnny Cochran, who was the uh, defense attorney for O.J. Simpson, who got a murderer off, essentially. Um, when Johnny Cochran died, the first image I thought of was uh, Mr. Cochran at the gates of heaven. And St. Peter was saying, I'm sorry, Johnny, if the halo don't fit, we don't admit. Now that's a pretty straightforward cartoon. But as I started doing more research on Cochran, I realized there was a whole other side to this man. He'd been very, very generous and engaged in many charitable causes. And it kind of seemed unfair to define him with one case. So I didn't do the cartoon. In the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But while these rights are indeed endowed by a creator and guaranteed by our Constitution, it is government that upholds the liberties, and it is men who constitute the government. There are those who believe the Constitution is merely a starting point for negotiation. James Madison wrote, I believe there are more instances of the abridgment of freedom of the people by gradual and silent encroachments by those in power than by violent and sudden usurpations. I think that's happening today. As they uh, destroy education and stop teaching what our constitutional liberties are, it's very easy to strip them away. Editorial cartoons are checked to the erosion of liberties and part of the first line of defense to the, advance of the, uh, to the advancement of the unrestrained power of government. One good editorial cartoon can have a significant impact on the political dialogue of the day. If done well, it can influence those who govern to govern responsibly and expose them when they do not. We want to be the catalyst for thought. You know, Einstein once said, two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity. And I'm, and I'm not sure about the universe. <laughs> Einstein was right. It is this axiom which makes political cartooning important. The people ultimately govern will make mistakes. They are human after all, or at least we think they're human. But history has demonstrated that those in power, that power can turn leaders into monsters. So editorial cartoonists will gladly point out the shortcomings of the powerful in an effort to keep them human. Now there's a reason our founding fathers included the right to a free press in the Constitution. Information is a necessary component as a guide for you in a political system based on self-governance and individual liberty and responsibility. A free pass, press should be a check on government, but unfortunately today, the only people that are more incompetent than this administration seems to be the Washington Press Corps. Now, a reporter's job is to be the purveyor of fact, to point out the injustice of the world and shine the hot spotlight of exposure to wound those perpetrators with the truth. Editorial cartoonists, we just go back and shoot the wounded. Now, I want to make a distinction here between the objective uh, news reporting and the subjective editorial page. I always find it funny when people call me up and, well, they, they don't call me Mr. Ramirez, they call me other names, but uh, they say, you're way too opinionated. And I have to explain to them, well, you know, that's, uh, that's why I'm on the opinion page. <laughs> but you know what? I realize these days it's hard to distinguish between the two. That's the failure of today's journalism. 
The truth is the mainstream media does an awful job, which is why people trust the media even less than they trust politicians. And we know how much people trust politicians. You know, obviously there's a convergence of media when people are, where people are relying on the web for information, but I think the media has played a huge role in that. Why would anybody want to buy misinformation when real information is available free online? You know, there's, there's a wide spread manipulation going on through the media. The mainstream media has been perpetuating a lot of myths and untruths to push a political agenda. Yeah, and it occurred to me while I was watching the anniversary of the Berlin Wall, I had just been there a week before the Berlin Wall fell, and then I was, year, I was there a year later, um, and the difference was just amazing between the socialist environment and individual liberty and a free market capitalist system. But kids these days don't even know what the Cold War is. I think Reagan, you know, it, rem it reminded me of Ronald Reagan. Uh, Reagan was perhaps the greatest president of modern times. And I think he provides us all a lesson in presidential leadership. You know, true is his oratorical skill that made him such a potent force. But it was his ideas and his unwavering belief in America, in America's greatness, that made him great. If you have ever been to the uh, Reagan Library up in Simi Valley, they show a clip of Reagan addressing a bunch of uh, cartoonists in the Rose Garden. I'm the guy in the third row, uh, right in front of the president. Of course, I had a lot more hair back then. But uh, you know, one thing I loved about Ronald Reagan was his sense of humor. He was essentially a political cartoonist with words. And uh, I remember the joke that he told that day was about the differences between the United the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, you know, democracy versus communism. And, and he said, you know, the difference between the United States and the Soviet Union is, in the United States, political cartoonists can draw editorial cartoons of the president of the United States. In the Soviet Union, political cartoonists must draw editorial cartoons on the president of the United States. <laughs> you know, Reagan, his jokes were funny, but what I loved about his humor was it always had a cogent point. You know, take uh, the Cold War with the USSR. On March 8, 1983, Ronald Reagan declared the Soviet Union the evil empire. And the reaction was immediate. A blanket of condemnation rose from the political pundits and the mainstream media. Critics and conventional wisdom called Reagan's remarks unpresidential. It was an abrogation of diplomacy. They characterized him as a doddering old man barely in charge of his faculties, who was unaware of what he was saying, and, and much, much worse. But in the most remote gulag, in the most remote, remote part of Siberia, in a dark, damp, and dingy cell, a sympathetic, sympathetic guard leaned over to a Soviet dissident, a political prisoner, and quietly whispered between the iron bars of his cell, Ronald Reagan has just called the Soviet Union the evil empire. The whisper hung in the air for a moment. The guard left the prisoner in the darkness of his prison cell. Quietly, the metallic sound of a worn spoon tapped against the stone in Morse code, which echoed along the walls of the gulag. Ronald Reagan has just called the Soviet Union the evil empire. One spoon tapping out the hopes of those imprisoned in the darkness, followed by another spoon, and another spoon, and another spoon, bursting into a cacophony of defiance. See, words have meaning, and Reagan's words marked the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union. Reagan was a crusader against evil in the world, and he boldly challenged Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall, and it did. Words are only powerful if they're pursued with meaning, purpose, and commitment, and action. The collapse of the Soviet Union was only one facet of Reagan's achievements. Reagan took us from the darkness. It's the complete opposite of what we see today. In fact, this, uh, this administration, I think, uh, the last six and a half years have been more com comparable to Jimmy Carter than Ronald Reagan, and it's a shame. 
mean, I can go through the litany of statistics. Uh, the national debt rising from 10.6 trillion to 17.9 trillion, median income down 2,000, food stamps climbing by 15 million. The labor participation rate dropping from 65.7% to 62.7%, with only 47% of those fully employed. Americans in poverty from 43.6% to 45.3%, and on and on and on. These are all things you should hear from the mainstream media, but it doesn't fit into their political agenda. It shouldn't be my job to tell you, but unfortunately these days it is. You see, a reporter's job is to, to tell the people the truth. You know, and at IBD we try to do that. I think the newspapers and the media have an obligation to give the readers the truth, not a politically correct version of the truth, not a filtered version of the truth, but simply the truth. And because journalists most often are human beings, they'll undoubtedly have their own interpreta interpretation of events, and that's what makes it so important to cover an issue in its entirety. Differing perceptions can easily color an issue. Let me give you an example. Sherlock Holmes and Watson went on a camping trip, and as they lay down to sleep, Holmes turned to Watson and he said, Watson, look up into the sky and tell me what you see. And Watson thought about it for a moment, and he said, well, I see millions and millions of stars. And Holmes said, well, what does it tell you? And Watson replied, well, astronomically, it tells me there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Theologically, it tells me that there must be a God to create something so beautiful, and that God is great, and we are small and insignificant. Meteorologically, it tells me, well, the since it's a beautiful, clear sky tonight, it's probably going to be a beautiful day tomorrow. And Watson turned to Holmes, and he said, what does it tell you? And Holmes looked up, and he said, somebody stole our tent. <laughs> we have a participatory democratic republic, the best system of government in the world, truly a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, but only if the people participate. And that's what I try to do with my editorial cartoons, try to get them engaged. Now, let me tell you another story. Um, and and if, you're, if you've heard my speech before, you've heard this story, but uh, I just love it. This story about a duck. This duck waddled into a store, and he went up to the manager and said, uh, got any grapes? And the manager looked at him and he said, uh, no, I'm sorry, we have no grapes. The duck said, oh, walked out. Ten minutes later, this duck comes waddling up to the manager and says, got any grapes? The manager looks at the duck and he says, uh, no, I have no grapes. I have no food section. Duck goes, oh, and walks out. Ten minutes later, the duck comes waddling in, goes up to the manager and says, got any grapes? The manager says, what is wrong with you, duck? I have no grapes. I will never have grapes. Duck goes, oh, walks out. Ten minutes later, the duck comes waddling. The manager goes, hold it right there, duck. If you ask me for grapes one more time, I'm going to nail your little web feet to the floor. Ask me for anything else. Don't ask me for grapes. The duck looks at the manager and he says, uh, got any nails? He says, no. Got any grapes? <laughs> you see, this, this joke provides a good working analogy of how I view Washington bureaucracies at work. See, in Washington, D.C., Things are not always represented as they truly are. In fact, we've got this whole Orwellian Obama doublespeak. Uh, for example, a slower increase in Medicare payments is not called a rational effort to save Medicare. It's called a draconian cut. A balanced budget amendment which stipulates Congress can only spend the amount of revenue they take in is not called common sense. It's called extremism. Making illegal immigration illegal is not called following the law. It's called insensitivity. Judging someone not by the content of their character, but strictly by the color of their skin, is not called racism, it's called affirmative action. Aborting a human fetus in its third trimester is not called killing, it's called a choice. When a government has a surplus, it doesn't mean we've paid too much in taxes, it just means we spent too little in services. Oh, and a tax is no longer called a tax, it's called an investment in America. No, wait, Vice President Biden called it patriotism. The battle our brave soldiers have undertaken against terrorism 
and Islamic extremism is no longer called the war on terror. It's called a overseas contingency operation. And the president said, uh, you know, the Islamic state of Syria is neither Islamic or a state. And blowing up buildings is no longer called terrorism. It's called a man-caused disaster. Well, frankly, I think this administration has been a man-caused disaster. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but I believe in the old adage, if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, then it's usually a duck. As an editorial cartoonist, it's my job to nail that duck to the floor because someone needs to watch over the institution for the intellectually challenged, I'm sorry, Congress, on behalf of the American public. See, politicians often forget who they work for. Because of the pomp and circumstance that surrounds these career political celebrities, we're lulled into thinking it is us who work for them, when in reality it is they who work for us. And editorial cartoons are there to remind them that they are the public servants, that they are elected to do your bidding and they are far from infallible. See, the, the problem with this country is not that we pay too little in taxes, it's that we support a government that's gotten too big and too intrusive. You know, our country was built around the idea of self-governance and independence, but 39% of Americans are on some kind of government program. One in six Americans are on direct government assistance. 50%, well, actually 47% of Americans do not pay federal taxes. And in the last election, we had, well, not this last election, but the election before, we had less than 58% turnout of all registered voters. And when you think about that, that means the President of the United States was elected by less than 25% of the eligible electorate. Is this the America you want? It certainly isn't the America that Ronald Reagan envisioned. It's amazing when you look back into history at a small group of colonies united to fight taxation without representation. It's clearly evident now that we face the same challenge. This is a nation founded on the principles of limited government, individual liberty, self-responsibility, and a strong national defense. I think past presidential terms hold the key to future presidential successes. George Washington once said, government is not reason, it is not eloquence, it is a force like fire. It is a dangerous servant and a fearful master. Calvin Coolidge, John F. Kennedy, and Ronald Reagan found that the solution to our economic problems rested not in the government, but in the ingenuity of the people. They believed in the doctrine of American exceptionalism. In their eyes, America was a place where the extraordinary could be, where the extraordinary could be extraordinary and be rewarded instead of penalized for the success. And, and in turn, their success would create innovations and jobs that benefited the average American and give those average Americans incentives to work hard and to dream to become extraordinary themselves so that others could simply remain as community organizers. <laughs> President Kennedy believed in an America that could reach for the stars not for the taxpayer's wallet. President Obama said it's time for America to rise to the challenge when Russians beat us into space with Sputnik. And I'm gonna do that by canceling our manned space program. It takes more than words and a good speech to make a great president. It takes great ideas. Reagan was an ex exceptional president because he truly believed America was an exceptional country. Ronald Reagan saw America as that shining city on a hill, not as a city among many, many cities. So my job essentially is to provide you with a concise message that can make you think about the issues and hopefully persuade you to my cause. So I'm gonna encourage you by showing you some of my editorial cartoons. Now, first off, I'm a capitalist pig, so this is my book, please buy it. <laughs> and of course, Investors Business Daily, uh, you can reach them by investors.com. They didn't make patches for me, but the next cruise I'll have advertising patches on me. <laughs> uh, here, this is why I love my job. Here's a picture of uh, President Clinton looking through the demilitarized zone in North and South Korea. 
If you read the copy, it says, President Clinton looks into binoculars which still have the lens caps on. <laughs> and it's not limited to him. It is a mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. Now, this is a, a new book. I'm just signing the contract uh, this week, this coming week, with Simon & Schuster for Thresholds. It's Give Me Liberty or Give Me Obamacare, an illustrated guide for impeachment. And uh, Vice President Cheney will be doing the forward, and Rush Limbaugh will be doing the backward. Thank you. Give me liberty or give me a government bailout. Not even a smidgen of corruption. <laughs> this one's kind of long, but it, it, it's an interesting exercise. Go and look at the articles of, of impeachment uh, against Richard Nixon. They never went through with him because he resigned. But each one of those uh, articles of impeachment could be applied to any one of the scandals that President Obama had. So the articles of impeachment versus the articles ignored by the press. And the Peter Principle, which now I call the Obama Principle. I've now been in 57 states, I think, with one left to go, Barack Hussein Obama. You see, the Peter Principle is when a person rises to the level of incompetence. The Obama Principle is when that person gets elected president. <laughs> and here's the imperial president. Congress is in session when I say it is. And here's a young Barack Obama. If you notice, all the problems, the answers are all government except for democracy is a form of social inequality. <laughs> he certainly has a lot of secret service for protection. Those are journalists. <laughs> I still can't get on the website, the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> Porous borders. Jimmy Carter, thank you. <laughs> now, I, the DEF CON is backwards, but that's something the Obama administration would do. But DEF CON 1 is 4, DEF CON 2 is give a speech, DEF CON 3 is hold a press conference, DEF CON 4 is cancel your fundraisers, and if we ever get to DEF CON 5, he has to cancel golf. We recommend boots on the ground, 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 and Obama's wearing boots on his ears. <laughs> and if you know, this is one thing I love to do um, in my cartoons, is I, th I still think he smokes. So I always put ashtrays with cigarettes in there. And if you look at all the, the pictures behind him, they're all pictures of himself. Can you hear me now? 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 And the NSA says yes. <laughs> the selfie. <laughs> American hustle. If you like your health plan, plan, you can keep your health plan, period, and it won't cost a dime. The fading light of liberty, leading from behind. So when you think about it, editorial cartoons are, are like advertising. With advertising, you're using a concise image to sell a product. With, with political cartoons, you're doing the same thing, but with a cartoon. Never mind, it's not a red line. It's just blood. The wave from the election. And you can see his pen and his phone flying behind him. I should have put a teleprompter in there somewhere. But... Um, this is after Obama. We found out that he wrote the fourth letter to Khomeini. Uh, it's on that song, uh, My Baby Wrote Me a Letter. Russia just invaded Ukraine. ISIS is even getting jet planes. A nuclear Iran is being born. Our credibility is gone. But baby, I wrote me a letter. We, the government. <laughs> so simple, concise images are the best editorial cartoons. This is the letter of intent going from a nation of achievement to a nation of entitlement. 
And of course, the stamp is a food stamp with President Obama's face on it. <laughs> Limited government, you bunch of extremists. Relax, I'm only going to hit him on the upper 2% of his body. <laughs> Attention, everyone. As you go into battle, the most important thing for you to know is Jones here is gay. <laughs> this is uh, President Obama's green economy. See the cigarette dangling from his mouth? Because that's what you want to do when you're holding a gas can, is smoke. <laughs> I have way too much fun. I, I can't believe I get paid to do this. <clears throat> you didn't build that. Somebody else made that happen. King George III built the roads. And he's the only one with a life vest on. If you know. The media lapdog. Yeah. That is Chris Matthews. <laughs> it was actually Obama who was feeling the tingling on his leg. Beating swords into food stamps. Mind if I play through? Good news, we have a ship full. We have a full ship, 7.1 million passengers on the Titanic. Someday, all this will be yours. <laughs> Don't worry, Mr. President, you can't be impeached for just being completely incompetent. <laughs> now, I, I, I thought I'd show you how a cartoon begins. Now, I usually, uh, I'll sketch down an idea as soon as I get it, uh, because otherwise, I'll forget it. So it starts off as a sketch. And then I add the line art, which is scanned into a computer. And then I apply the screen, which sort of gives it a little more depth. And then finally, the full color, or the first color, and then the full color was, was shading. So since I co-manage the editorial page, basically I have, I have editorial meetings from 8 to 10. And then from 11 uh, on, I, I talk to our writers, um, start thinking about cartoon ideas. And then really from noon to 3.30 is when the cartoon gets done. This is from the 94 Pul Pulitzer Collection. The, the, it depends on the, what the meaning of is is, William Jefferson Clinton. On US-Japan trade, aren't they supposed to face you when they bow? And in light of the modernization of society, we'd like to renegotiate the Ten Commandments down to four and a half. <laughs> Moral values. If it were not for reporters, I would tell you the truth, Chester Arthur. Our moral fabric. This is one of my favorite cartoons because it's so simple. It's elegant in its design. It's very simple. You see the moral fabric unraveling. That's what a good editorial cartoon ought to be. I wish I could do that every day. Father, you can't say prayers during graduation ceremonies, but if you print them on condoms, we'd be happy to distribute them. <laughs> what I wanted to do on Father's Day, meet my father. Here's a black man with a black kid, a white man with a white kid. The black man's thinking white, the white man's thinking black, and the kids are saying, look, another kid. Unsupervised children going into the grave of gangs. You two here to be married? Yes. We'll step up and be counted. Why society would try to impose its moral values on us is beyond me. It's perfectly natural for two people in love to want to get married. Your father should be proud of you. He is my father. <laughs> this is <laughs> Elliot Spitzer's news conference. This is after the shooting in the schools. Um, this is why. Hollywood. You can fool all of, all of the people some of the time, and some of the people all of the time, but you cannot fool all of the people all of the time, Abraham Lincoln. 
In ancient times, people worshipped the stars out of ignorance. <laughs> and could somebody please explain me that, uh, what is that uh, reality show, the, uh, the gals, Kardashians. Somebody, can, can somebody explain that show to me and why it has any appeal whatsoever? Yeah. Who would callously glamorize drugs and tobacco just for profit? Hollywood. <laughs> Son, your father and I have decided not to let you watch television anymore because it promotes violence. Touch my remote and I'll kill you. <laughs> uh, Michael Jackson, remember when he held the kid over the banister? Here's Michael Jackson. The kid was thinking, Michael Jackson's my father. Oh, please let go. <laughs> Here's his sister, Janet, in the wardrobe <laughs> malfunction. You see, I, I'm inherently evil. Today on Martha Stewart Living, I'll be demonstrating how to cook your own goose. <laughs> Junior, it's time to take your Lipitor. Not now, Mom, I'm playing baseball. Reality TV, TV, the voyeur. I, I just feel when you watch that stuff, it's like peeking into your neighbor's window or something. I just don't get it. Katie Couric, I'm not just a reader of the news. Pause next paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> Here's when Cheryl Atkinson left CBS News. <laughs> It might seem like I'm picking on CBS News, but I am. Okay. <laughs> Domestic affairs, a government big enough to give you everything you want is a government big enough to take from you everything you have, Gerald Ford. Marble country. Because of the soaring cost of medical malpractice insurance, we don't have any doctors left. However, rest assured, we have the best lawyers operating on you today. Don't ask, don't ask, don't ask. <laughs> you know, I don't even know how I got that in the LA Times, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> Affirmative action. Uh, are, are your phones distracting? Can I call you back? Now, this was after the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled against the Pledge of Allegiance. Bryson, Boba the Clown was all booked up, so we got the next best thing. Are you really from the U.S. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals? <laughs> Viva Bilingual Education, and here to share his personal success story through bilingual edu education is Miguel. Okay? <laughs> We need better immigration laws. Profiling is politically incorrect. Besides, they pose no real threat to us. <laughs> well, you have a slight temperature. We're not sure why, so we're going to have to amputate your legs. <laughs> this is the entitlements. We have $128 trillion in unfunded liabilities and entitlements today, Social Security and Medicare. I was kind of hoping for a regular doctor. We have to pay for this health care bill somehow. <laughs> Do you see the little witch doctor? Yeah, okay. Freeze. Homicide, burglary, worse. Trans fat. Raise your hands and step away from the chicken. <laughs> Barry Bonds trying to fit in Babe Ruth's shoes, proving that steroids do not make you bigger. This is a U.S. border fence with the service entrance. <laughs> what do you call doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results? <laughs> California. <laughs> de Blasio is New York City. Ebola, if I can make it there, I'll make it everywhere. <laughs> the hitchhiker. 
I mean, it doesn't bother anybody that uh, North Korea is proliferating the world with three-stage rockets. India, China, Russia. We're paying seven times the amount, I think, to take a, a U.S. astronaut on a Russian, uh, Russian rocket to a space station that we practically built by ourselves. I have a, a degree in scatological poetry and $160,000 in student loans. I need help. Get a degree in basic math. <laughs> U.S. Border, Mr. Border Patrol, tear down this wall. Global, cool, global cooling, global warming, climate change, climate disruption, it's called weather. <laughs> Economics, the business of America is business, Calvin Coolidge. Saving Social Security. <laughs> I just love the happy faces on the guys. <laughs> Prescription drugs, well don't just sit there, pay the man. How electric cars work. <laughs> I'm okay, I landed on a taxpayer. <laughs> Made in China. I wish we had free medical care like in Cuba. I wish we had good medical care like in the United States. Speaking of releasing toxic emissions, <laughs> Obama's death panel, let's start with jobs. <laughs> Government is not reason, it's not eloquence, it's a force like fire, it is a dangerous servant and a fearful master, George Washington. This is the Lincoln bedroom during the Clinton administration. <laughs> this was the best time for political cartoonists. I figure if you had a meter there, they could just charge them by the minute. The stain, sorry. I know you just had lunch, I'm sorry. Not really. President Clinton, I did not have factual relations with the American people. <laughs> like I'm the one who needs to be neutered. <clears throat> Now, I have to say, I, when I won the Pulitzer, the, the president was gracious enough to have her and her husband send me a con congr congratulatory note to which I gathered all my Clinton cartoons and I put a little note on it that said, uh, thanks, I couldn't have done it without you. <laughs> I thought it was funny at the time until I got audited four and a half months later. <laughs> Here's a Clinton memorial drawn at the right angle because his pants were around his ankles. The Clinton autobiography with pullout, I think that's Miss July. Here's Bill's problem and Hillary's problem. The U.S. Senate Republicans at the feeding trough. Now, there's a debate when Nancy Pelosi was Speaker of the House. She wanted her own form of transportation. I thought she already had it. This, this is a doctor. This is anatomically correct, by the way. The Mad Hatter. We have to pass this bill so you can find out what, what's in it. And this is the most ethical Congress ever, Nancy Pelosi. I'm sorry, Ms. Warren, but Bolsheviks are not an Indian tribe. <laughs> Monica Lewinsky said the other week, uh, I fell in love with my boss. Here's Bill Clinton talking to his boss. <laughs> Presidents during a crisis, four score and seven years ago. Obama, four. <laughs> Nothing brings out the lower traits of human nature like office seeking, Rutherby Hayes, the parting of the GOP, John McCain. Kerry Sutra, the many positions of John Kerry. <laughs> Is there anything in the wardrobe to make him look thinner? 
The answer, Ronald Reagan, 100 times. Dennis Kucinich, of course, they've seen a UFO. How do you think I got here? <laughs> now, imagine waking up to this and on the operating table, Hillary with a scalpel saying, don't worry, I have experience. I'm not a surgeon, but I was married to one for eight years. <laughs> Obama's rhetoric, Obama's policies. And here's uh, Obama pouring water on the wicked witch of the East, Hillary Clinton, but she just won't go away. <laughs> McCain, I can reach across the aisle to Democrats? No, Republicans. <laughs> I was dead broke. That'll be $200,000, please. <laughs> Here's uh, Christy and the bridge is closed. The Democrats and Obamacare. Hillary Clinton's book, My Accomplishments, Chapter One, The End. <laughs> Hello, Tattoo Removal Service. <laughs> this is what I call the Coyote Ugly Election where you have to gnaw your arm off to get away from the person you're with. Did you vote for Obama? I cannot confirm or deny it, but let me just say my campaign has been clear on the issue of the question. Do you think voters are stupid? I cannot confirm or deny it, but let me just say my campaign has been clear on the issue of the question. I was named after Sir Edmund Hillary. Of course, he didn't climb Everest until five years after she was born. In Bosnia, we landed under sniper fire. I learned how to make a killing in futures by reading the Wall Street Journal, the reset button. Benghazi was caused by video. I was dead broke. I didn't really mean businesses don't create jobs. What difference at this point does it make? <laughs> World affairs, we're a nation that has a government, not the other way around, and that makes us special among the nations of the earth. Ronald Wilson Reagan. Remember the Alien Gonzalez case? Yes, Elian, someday all this will be yours. Is, Ru is Russia reverting back to Soviet-style oppression? You're darn Putin. <laughs> America sucks. Oh, and give me my allowance, the United Nations. Here's Fidel, slowly burning away. Chavez is mini-me. Putin. What's the matter? Never seen a dolphin before? <laughs> Iran, negotiate for a couple more weeks. Gaddafi. The short program with uh, Putin and Ukraine. The reset button. Iran. Now I got a lot of a lot of threats from this, but I gave him Jack Fowler's address. So, <laughs> Assad, you were saying the fat lady, the threat to America, Obama's feckless foreign policy. To the Foley family, I want you to know all my thoughts are with you. And he's got his driver. If civilization to survive, we must cultivate the science of human relationships, the ability of all peoples of all kinds to live together in the same world of peace. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Here's the first intifada. <laughs> How dare you defend yourself? And why we don't have peace. It's kind of hard to have peace with somebody who wants to eliminate you off the face of the earth. September 11, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance, Thomas Jefferson. This is a cartoon I did on 9-11. The lack of coordination between the intelligence communities. I got it, I got it. Frankly, I can't think of a bigger threat to America than the assault on our civil liberties. This moment must never be forgotten. Hey, dudes, what's up? 
Can you believe it took two hours to get through airport security, stinking Patriot Act, and what's with this 87 billion for Iraq? What you doing? You had to say you would do anything to feel safer. <laughs> War, I never saw a pessimistic general win a battle, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Now this is my favorite pre-Iraq war uh, cartoon. It's a, uh, Saddam at the psychic. She's looking in the crystal ball and saying, run. <laughs> it's totally unrealistic to turn over power to the Iraqis in 30 days. The French ambassador, why? We turned over our government to the Nazis in under 30 days. <laughs> Got Saddam. The case against Saddam, composed of dead bodies. 50,000 reasons why the world is better off without Saddam Hussein. I, I went to the Ba'athist headquarters in Baghdad when I visited the troops. Each headquarters had their own swimming pool, but they never used it for the community. They used it to torture and execute people, and there's still blood, blood uh, stains on the tiles. He was a horrible human being. The world is better off without him. Catching bin Laden. Uh, Iraq, don't forget your golf clubs, Mr. President. Don't worry, these cuts will just make you leaner. <laughs> Meanwhile, the doctor who identified Bill Laden for the CIA still sits in a Pakistani prison. Kerry, the U.S. would like to know how Iran can help us with, with these Iraq, Iraqi insurgents. Well, we can threaten them with nukes. This is from the 2008 Pulitzer Collection. One of the great things about books is sometimes there are some fantastic pictures, George W. Bush. <laughs> I have no idea what it is, but I feel strangely attracted to it. This is, uh, I looked the man in the eye, he, I was able to get a sense of his soul, Bush on Putin. I think Putin was wearing contacts that day. Whatever the cost may be, we shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. Harry Reid, run away. Social Security again. Excuse me, but I'm, I'm going to need that to run my car. The great wall between uh, product safety inspections and factories in China. Hillary Clinton, I pledge no more personal attacks on my drug-addicted, possibly Muslim opponent. <laughs> A tribute to the heroes in the California fire fire, uh, firefight. The CBS anchor. <laughs> Ahmadinejad giving a speech on the coffin of an American soldier in New York. Chavez uh, hitting hammers and sickles. Fashions for the ignorant celebrity. Yeah, there's, this is based on a celebrity who went down to uh, Peru with a mal, mal bag, not knowing that the Shining Path was responsible for the Civil War there and the 70,000 deaths. You know, images and words have meanings. For the last time, if you don't tell us where you planted the nuclear device, we'll have no choice but to appoint a lawyer for you. The ATM and the AMT, taking his wallet. Now, I love this cartoon because it's based on something uh, Sheryl Crow actually said. Uh, meet Sheryl Crow, she uses only one square of toilet paper per bathroom visit to fight global warming. And she's holding her hand out. <laughs> My job is just too easy. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I was going to do a brief con uh, conclusion, but you don't want to hear me say a bunch of stuff. Um, what I think I'll do is, since we have about four or five minutes left, I'll take questions if any of you guys want to ask any questions. Otherwise, let's get on with this great cruise. Yes. Where you get t-shirts? 
You know, I, I don't have t-shirts with the images on it, but uh, I did think of a great t-shirt idea, though, with a Secret Service logo on the front and then a, a, a words on the back that said, I'm with stupid. <laughs> but you know what? You can get my book, though, at Amazon. It's, it's cheapest there, so if you want to get the book. Yes? Uh, no, you can find it at investors.com slash cartoons. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, and of course, with the National Review. Yes? Um, did you guys hear what the question was? Do, do these uh, ideas come to you naturally? Actually, I, I have a daily conversation with my neighbor's dog. And since they've taken away all my weapons, I have to do cartoons instead. Now, they, they actually, uh, they come out of my twisted mind. You know, the, the, what's ironic about this is I hate drawing. I mean, I, I love the analysis. I'll just read all day long. My fiance can tell you how boring I really am. Um, I love the, the creative aspect of the job when you come up with a visual metaphor. I mean, it's kind of a challenge every day, although with this administration, it's more like stenography than anything creative. <laughs> The hardest part of my job is, is narrowing it down from the 15 ideas I come up with per day down to just one or two. Uh, and then I hate drawing it because it never comes out as good in my, you know, as, as it does in my mind's eye. And uh, because of my limitations as an artist, I can't do some of these really wonderful uh, ideas that I think of, which is probably good. It'd probably get me banned somewhere. Yes? Yes, yeah, so the question was, do I ever get critiques or warnings from people that uh, I lampoon? You know what, politicians for the most part are pretty smart. They know not to pick a fight, but occasionally you do. And, uh, and I was telling people at my dining table that uh, when I was with the LA Times, I took over for Paul Conrad, and he had this huge office because he was really an icon of journalism. And I started getting hate mail right away because we're so different. And uh, I taped them to the wall. By the time I left, it was seven layers thick. And, and you know, occasionally you have, to, uh, you have to forge some of this stuff because you'll, you'll get these meticulous hate mail where people cut out letters and just glue it together. Um, and of course, the interns always hated the fact that I made them uh, open my mail. <laughs> but we only lost a couple of them. You know. Uh, but you know, it's sort of like the medals you wear. Uh, you know, if you write me a piece of hate mail, it's just going to make my day. Uh, and, and a funny anecdote I was telling uh, people at my table. I may be the only Pulitzer Prize winner to protest himself. Uh, and the first Pulitzer, uh, I had done this cartoon where I had this, uh, this guy sitting on a tombstone. The tombstone was labeled AIDS-related AIDS deaths. And the debate was whether or not you should get testing for HIV. And, uh, so this guy's sitting on the tombstone, and he's saying, but testing would severely curtail my lifestyle. And there's a bubble coming out of the grave saying, tell me about it. And what's going to more severely curtail your lifestyle than being dead? And I just thought it was irresponsible if you're engaged in whatever behavior, HIV, you know, uh, uh, needle drug users or, or gays. I think you have a responsibility to tell the people around you whether or not you have this disease. So... After that came out, it was about a, a month and a half after I won the, uh, the Pulitzer, uh, the president of GLAAD saw that cartoon and called me up. Now, I have a policy where I don't think you ought to do a cartoon if you can't substantiate it. So I'm willing to uh, back any cartoon that I've done and explain the reasons why I've done it. And I have a policy, if you call my office, that, uh, you know, just give me 30 seconds to explain uh, what the idea is behind the cartoon, and then I'll let you say whatever you want. But she just refused to let me get a word in edgewise. And she just called me all kinds of names. So this went on for about four and a half minutes, and I finally said, look, uh, just give me 30 seconds to tell you why I think it's important. And then she said, you know, a bunch of other names, and she said, you're racist, sexist, homophobe. To which I replied, well, look, I, I understand your frustration. I've been a lesbian all my life. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so she hung up the phone, and that was the uh, genesis of the the largest protest ever at a Pulitzer ceremony. So now, one of the luxuries of being an editorial cartoonist is nobody has any idea what I look like. Um, and, and so, you see, I used Jonah Goldberg's photo on my columns. 
but, but anyhow, uh, we were pulling up to the Pulitzer Soma, which is a noontime luncheon. It's, it's much more casual than what they show in the movies. And as we pull up in the limo, all these protesters came running over to the car, and they had pink tutus and, and you know, green spiked hair. And so I got out of the limo, ready to engage in, in battle, and my editor got out with me, and before I could say anything, they handed me a flyer protesting myself. They had no idea what I looked like. <laughs> and before I could say anything, my editor grabbed the paper, and he said, I know this Ramirez guy. He's a big jerk, and they all cheered. So now I was there with my best friends, Paul Shanklin, who does the, uh, the voice impersonations on the Rush Limbaugh show, Chip Saltzman, who was the, uh, uh, Mike Huckabee's campaign manager, and we're all in suits. So we got in the picket line, and we were picketing myself, and I was holding a, <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, holding a banner that said, Racine Ramirez uh, Pulitzer. And they actually had to come out of the library and get me because they were starting the Pulitzer ceremony without me. But it was just way too much fun. So, you see, I, I'm obnoxious, so I get paid to be obnoxious. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, thank you all for having me here. I hope you enjoyed this cruise. <laughs>